<coughs> Hi, Mick McQuaid here to briefly discuss learning the Vim editor. And before I begin, I'd like to tell you why I would like you to learn the Vim editor. In the um, um, lecture notes for a couple of courses, I've listed a number of items that I want you to, uh, to learn about. Oops, sorry, I hit myself. Um, and these are items that appear in Vim that also appear in any um, robust text editor. Um, I've become concerned that many programming students use Notepad uh, as their text editor or Pico or some kind of, of um, ill-featured uh, text editor. And this will not help you in uh, terms of productivity in the workplace. You need a, a more fully featured uh, text editor. Quite a bit of what you have to do in the workplace is to do well understood tasks faster than other people in order to compete successfully. And a, um, a good knowledge of a text editor that's sort of your text editor that you use for lots and lots of different programming tasks uh, can help you achieve this goal of, of having a shorter, one, one way to, to describe this is to call it a shorter cycle time than, um, than your rivals. A uh, shorter cycle time in uh, well understood task cycles. And so these are some of the features that are present in Vim that are also present in its, uh, its competitors or its uh, colleagues, its rivals, whatever you want to call them. Um, these names occur in, in Vim, but a description of what they do uh, should awaken you to, to um, the presence of this kind of feature in, uh, in any text editor. Now, I've selected Vim for a, a very good reason. It is ubiquitous, so it, it is available for any platform, either in a terminal um, basis or a GUI basis, for any computing platform probably that exists in the world. There, there's probably nothing, uh, no machine that does not have either Vim or a cut-down version of it. Um, so uh, this will always be uh, available. Um, that's one reason why it's my text editor of choice, and consequently I know more about these features in Vim and I can answer questions about them uh, as opposed to other uh, text editors. It's not that I say that Vim is better than any other uh, text editor. This is the one that I know, and it is ubiquitous. It will, you'll, you'll always be able to get access to it. Once you uh, understand from in this course what these features are, you can probably find them in any robust text editor that you want to pick as, as your text editor. I don't want to be a text editor Nazi here. So uh, let me just um, go over what these features are. These first two refer to split windows. So you must have, as a programmer, you must have split windows, and you must be able to split them horizontally, which is the case with the split command, or vertically uh, with the vSplit command. And you should not have to write out a command. You can actually write out these commands, but you can also assign these commands to, to keystrokes. Um, and you should be able to work easily with split windows, for example, swapping the windows from, from left to right, uh, or, or up and down, or rotating a, a bunch of, of split windows. This is necessary. You have to have this if you want to be a professional programmer. You have to have folding for a professional. Uh, a professional programmer needs folding. So um, if you program using an object-oriented language, you may have what you do divided into classes. If you program in C, you have what you do divided into functions. I happen to have a window open here in uh, Markdown. This window um, here is a, um, a, an assignment for a class written in Markdown, and I'm, I just folded it. I just folded the thing up completely. This is a Vim uh, window, and I folded it into three sections. One section is the problem specification, which has six lines. Uh, one is the entity relationship diagram description, which has 108 lines, and the other one is the um, narrative requirement, which has three lines. So uh, folding the word folding refers to the folding of a piece of paper. So if I were to fold, if I had this stuff written on a piece of paper, I could fold it so that only the headings show. Um, you have to be able to, to hide information in order to concentrate on the information that's important to you in programming. And folding is a way to do it. This also, by the way, illustrates syntax highlighting because this is syntax highlighting according to Markdown. By the way, Markdown is the sort of official documentation language on GitHub, so you should get used to using Markdown. And this does make a good uh, example 
of, um, of folding, but you could imagine these as being classes or functions or declarations or whatever, you know, prototypes, whatever it is, depending on what kind of language you're, you're writing in. Um, you have the you have to have the ability to selectively fold and unfold things so that you can look at the overview that you can look at at um, details and and potentially in large very large projects you have to be able to fold uh, among projects that contain you know hundreds or perhaps thousands of of files and within those files um, hundreds or thousands of um, of groups of of blocks of of code of some kind. Let me return to this uh, split and, and uh, v-split and folding. Okay, so the next thing is your uh, editor should have uh, support for regular expressions. And um, you should be able to use regular expressions in a lot of ways. You should be able to find things with regular expressions. So in, in Vim, for example, if I press the slash key, um, hopefully that's still visible at the bottom of the screen there. I just press the, uh, the slash key and that opens up a regular expression search. And now I can search, for example, for the string the. Um, this happens to be set to be case insensitive, so it found the string the both with upper and uh, and lower case. Um, I could, for example, find uh, the only as a complete word. Let's see, what do I say? A word? Um, is that a boundary? No. What do, what do I do for a boundary? Is it? Uh, there we go. So that's the only as a complete word. I, I used a regular expression to denote um, non-letters uh, around the. So that did not get, that did not pick up the word they, which is around here someplace, and I can't, uh, oh, here it is, they. It was not picked up by this, but when I just said the, um, that also picked up uh, they and, uh, and there and some other things. And of course, I could make this uh, Case sensitive. If I wanted to, I could say, uh, let's see, how do I do case sensitivity? I honestly cannot recall. Um, I think I is insensitive. So what could um, S be sensitive? Nah. Uh, well, here's a, a a good tip for using um, Vim. Uh, you can access an enormous uh, help, an enormous amount of help, and um, if I search for case here. I can uh, find non lowercase, non lowercase, ignore case. Um, do not use the ignore case option. So I could have said set ignore case or set no ignore case. Um, but I could also say backslash C. Backslash capital C to, to not ignore uh, case. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to quit the, the help here. And I'm going to say um, the like this and see if that will do what I think that it does. Um, did that now ignore the case? Uh, not ignore the case? Yes. Yeah, so that only gave me the, the lowercase one. So let me try to do the same thing with um, capital the. And then further, let me try. So that does obviously work. And then let me also try. Um, the uh, capital the as a word without words like um, there or or they. Okay, so um, regular expressions can be searched in Vim, and uh, they can also be used in replace operations and global operations. So searching and, and replacing um, should be able to be done in a sophisticated way. I should be able to search patterns and replace patterns, not just with specified text, but I should be able to search and replace things where I don't actually know exactly what's there. I simply know that it fits some kind of pattern, and I want to replace it with some pattern that may include what it is I found without knowing that. And Vim will allow us to, to, to do that. I'm not going to demonstrate that right now, but it, it's uh, an important part of um, why it is important to have regex instead of just having I guess I could have just moved this over, couldn't I? Uh, except that now it's really tiny. Oh well, who cares? Oh, that's why I made it big, so it, um, so I wouldn't go on to the next the next things. Okay, so um, doing global commands. This is something that's. Uh, specific to coding. This is not something that we see in word processing. For example, in word processing, um, 
we may have a, um, a piece of text that is on one line. So this, all this text here is on line 9 of this file, and my um, uh, text um, processing to, to uh, convert this into a PDF will put it all on, on separate lines itself. Typically in code, though, we have very short lines, no more than, 100, say, 120 characters long. Everything is on, um, on separate lines that fit across the, the screen. And so um, we do a lot of operations line-wise, and the global command lets us do that, remove all the, the lines that contain, um, space, that contain nothing but spaces uh, if they follow uh, a line that also contains nothing but spaces. For example, that would be an example of a global command. Syntax highlighting you can see here with, uh, with Markdown, and of course syntax highlighting should be available for any um, language. And if we take a look at um, uh, there is oh here we go. So yes, yeah, show file types. So so here are the languages that Vim will uh, highlight. And unfortunately, this is going off the screen, so you're not seeing Bazaar, BC, BDF, BibTeX, Bind, and and blank. Um, and here you can see all of, of C, uh, almost all of, of, uh, of that. But anyway, what I'm trying to give you is the idea that there are a lot of languages for which syntax highlighting is done automatically. And syntax highlighting has a lot of benefits um, that are not obvious to you immediately. Um, it's very important to have. I think some students don't care about it because having not used it, they think that it simply makes the... Um, the display look better, but it actually has a lot of practical uses that speed up your your coding. So every every text editor has to have that. Um, hex editing. A text editor should be able to edit things as as hex. Just um, yesterday, and I can't remember exactly how it happened, but just yesterday I had a file that had an invisible character in it. I did not know what the character was. I knew that something was messing up my file. Um, but by switching into a hex editing mode, I was able to see the, the character that was uh, otherwise invisible. Uh, DBEXT, this is a particular tool for Vim for working with databases that allows you to send um, lines from a, a, a text file in Vim to a relational database, such as MySQL, and then receive um, results, query results back. Um, this is simply an example. I just put this in here as an example of um, communication between the editor has to be able to communicate with the programming language that you're using, and um, Vim has lots of these kinds of of, um, of things available. In fact, if I say uh, let's see, if I say version, um, I'll see that this was compiled with support for a number of languages. You can see Python there, uh, Lua. There, TCL, TK, there, there, there are a whole bunch of, of um, languages uh, that you can you can actually write code um, and and execute it within Vim. That's not even just communicating with the, the language. That's actually doing it within uh, Vim. That's in addition to what I'm I'm talking about with DBEXT. And then the last one that I have here is called Vim Diff. This is simply the, the um, the ubiquitous diff utility. You, you have used the diff utility probably many times, but I've discovered that a lot of students don't know that they're using it. Um, and it's built in, the reason that they don't know they're using it is because it's built into a lot of other programs. So uh, among many other programs, it's built into Vim. So you can compare files and see how they've changed uh, in a graphical way uh, using Vim. By the way, I'm using graphical Vim here. This is uh, in um, a Mac OS X window. Um, one of the main reasons to use Vim, though, is that it's available in, um, in terminals. And increasingly, people are doing work using uh, Amazon's EC2 or other cloud providers where they log into this remote machine, and it's impractical to log into it uh, with a GUI at the other end. It's very practical, particularly if, you, if you're logging into lots and lots of, of EC2 machines, uh, virtual machines at the same time to use a terminal login, and, and um, so Vim is available there, whereas many graphical editors are not. Now, of course, you can actually edit files in the graphical Vim on remote machines. That's possible with any um, robust text editor also. Um, 
However, the other machine sort of has to let you in, and not all machines do that, so you may need to log in separately and then use a terminal-based editor on that other machine. It depends on what protocols machines uh, support. So these are basically the things that I want you to know about Vim. How do you know these things? Well, there are um, because Vim is one among the most popular editors, um, there are countless tutorials. So here I've Googled Vim tutorial, and there are a huge number of tutorials. But I don't think that you should uh, take these tutorials without first knowing one little piece of information that doesn't seem to always make it into tutorials, which is a diagram of the modes of Vim. So here I've, I've uh, image Googled for Vim modes diagram. And all of these, or, or many of these, contain what I consider to be the essential information. The essential information is that there are three main modes. Um, these three modes are illustrated in several of these diagrams, and um, they are referred to by different names. So you can see that um, in this one it says insert mode. That's the traditional uh, word for the mode in which Vim behaves like a typewriter. Any, any key that you press shows up in the, in the document. Here it's called input mode and um, here it's called text mode uh, and you can call it whatever you want. In the Vim documentation it'll be called insert mode but um, many of these, uh, many of the tutorials will call it something else. But you know, you feel free to use any of the, the tutorials, it doesn't matter. The second mode is called command mode and in this mode Vim behaves like a, uh, the keyboard behaves like a control panel. So it's not really like a computer keyboard, or like a typing keyboard. It's more of a control panel where each button that you press issues a command to Vim. This is because the ancestor of Vim um, was produced at a time when keyboards didn't have very many keys. They had no function keys, they had no um, numeric keypad, they had no page up and page down, all those uh, home and end keys, all that stuff was not um, present. You basically just had uh, letters of the alphabet, uh, numerals, uh, control and shift. That was about it. If you were lucky, you might have another key um, that would come under, would have uh, different names. Eventually, the name Alt was settled on, but that um, that happened later than this. So, having very few keys, um, the uh, author of Vim, a guy, a very bright and very funny uh, character named Bill Joy. You can see a lot of videos of him on YouTube. He's He did Vim 30 years ago. He doesn't think about her. He did the ancestor of Vim 30 years ago. He doesn't talk about that kind of stuff. He talks about social issues on, on YouTube these days. And um, the, the computers that he had uh, available to him had so few keys that he wanted to remap the keyboard uh, depending on what he was doing. So um, So it would be either a typewriter or a control panel. And then there's a third mode, which here is called the bottom line mode, and I think I saw somewhere else here, yeah, called last line mode. Um, it has EX in parentheses. The official name in Vim uh, documentation is EX mode. Here it's called ED mode, um, and, and it may be called something else. And that is simply the mode that I was in when I pressed the uh, colon. Um, I got into this mode called last line mode or bottom line mode or EX mode and it allows me to type um, commands in. For example, what did I type in? I think I typed help regex or something like that. And I could just type help uh, and open just a, a general um, help screen. Um, so the important thing, the reason that I want you to look at these diagrams of the modes is so that you'll understand an important fact um, about how Vim, oh I see, I actually replaced my face on purpose there. An important fact um, about um, how Vim behaves, one of the biggest frustrations for a new user of Vim is that you don't know what mode you're in. And if you don't know what mode you're in and you press the escape key twice, you'll be in command mode. And that's something that's evident on many of these. The escape key um, puts you into into command mode. Huh, it's, not, it's not mentioned here, but it is a fact that pressing the escape uh, key while you're in this mode or pressing the escape key while you're in this mode will put you in this mode. Pressing the escape key while you're in this mode leaves you in this mode. Um, and it is also possible, where do you have to press, the, there's some place where you have to press the escape key twice to get into this mode. So um, where can you press the escape key? There's some place where you might press the escape key and it doesn't work, but at, at any point, if you press the escape key twice, you're in 
this uh, command mode. And I think that you need to know that. I think you need to see how these three modes work before you start the, the tutorial. I think you have a, a visual representation of that helped me. That was actually how I first uh, learned this was uh, there, uh, a very uh, old book, actually, uh, which reminds me there are plenty of books available about Vim in the library, including many that are um, available online. So if we look at uh, the uh, RIT catalog at library.rit.edu and type in Vim. Uh, here's an online book about Vim. Here's an online book about Vim that I have opened in another window. Um, here's a, um, a book that is available uh, online, but their, their copy of it is, uh, is hard copy. Um, here's another online, and um, here's another online. Uh, here's another hard copy. So there are plenty of books on Vim. The book that um, that I got this diagram from actually I think may have even predated Vim itself. It was a book called um, um, the VI Text Editor or or Learning the VI Editor. That's what it was called, Learning the VI Editor, and it was a um, yeah, it was one of these um, O'Reilly books. And it's now been changed to be called the VI and Vim editors, um, and that uh, a basic diagram of the kind. Oh, I guess it was in one of these windows here. Um, a basic diagram like this appeared in there with these um, three main modes and the um, and the uh, arrows showing how to get from one to another. With this most important aspect being that you can always press the escape key to get into this uh, command mode. Now, many of these diagrams, I, I chose Vim modes diagram here, um, but I see that some of the Vim cheat sheets show the modes as colors on the keyboard. So it gives you a, a picture of how the keyboard will behave uh, depending on um, what mode you're in, uh, which I find confusing unless you already know about mode. If you just look at this without uh, without knowing that modes exist, um, it would be problematic. So, um, although these appear to me to be, these are all command mode things. So in command mode, you may want to move the cursor around. Um, there are commands that you, um, that you may want to issue while you're moving around. And it says here, if red enters insert mode, and in fact, there are many ways to enter insert mode. You can, um, put a line, uh, insert a line, uh, open a line. I can't see open here. Where is it? Letter o. This, this keyboard looks a little deficient to me. I mean, my keyboard has, has a letter O over here somewhere. This is weird. Actually, I'm not really crazy about this. Here's one that looks more like my keyboard. Okay, QWERTY, yeah. So I, all, the, all the ones in red here, um, will enter insert mode, uh, substitute a line, insert a line, open a line, append a line, change a line, and so on. Um, so these are all commands. These are all commands that, that move the cursor around. Operator requires a motion afterwards, operates between cursor and destination. So this would be equivalent to a button that you push, and then um, you have to push another button to determine how it happens. So I can, for example, there are lots of, of commands where I might want to to um, mark, uh, for example, a place in the file. I want to mark the, the beginning of a class or the beginning of a function or something. And um, uh, I may have lots of marks. So I may, so the mark command will require me to put the mark, put a given mark in a, in a particular place. So, uh, so it's a, it's a two button uh, operation. Yeah, these are all, these are all um, command mode things. And down here, you can see a few of the EX or bottom line mode commands. These are all commands that begin with a colon. All things that begin with a colon. Write the file, uh, open a file for editing, search and replace, uh, get help, and so on. So anyway, these, um, these graphical, I would, I would take some of these graphical tools uh, and open them in another window while I'm doing a tutorial. The, the only one that you need before the tutorial, I think, is, is this, before doing any tutorial, is this. 
um, and then I think you'll be okay to do a tutorial. Now, the um, one of the books that, that I found has a, uh, a tutorial here. Um, you, of course, oh, I <laughs> must log in through your library. I did, but um, I logged in quite some time ago. So let me try this again. Let me see what happens here. Okay, good. Yeah, so um, the, um, the library login, which I did off screen, I did that before I started this video, will kick you out after a little while. Um, and you have to trick it into letting you back in. Um, oh, okay, and then this tutorial is also going to go into Tmux, which is, is one of our other important topics. We've got to do Tmux as well, but that's a separate topic. From uh, Vim, Tmux is a called a is a short for terminal multiplexer, and this is how we keep multiple terminals open on multiple machines in a set of coordinated windows. And we do this and uh, leave these running. So let's say that I'm working on something in the lab here, um, in a terminal to uh, Amazon.com. My terminal is connected to here in the the lab. I'm connecting to a machine or, or uh, some dozens of machines that I have, virtual machines I have running at, uh, at EC2. And um, so I have all these terminal windows open in the lab and I want to go home. Um, I don't want to have to close all the windows and then reopen them later. So by using Tmux, I can detach from the windows. They go away from the lab. They're no longer available to the lab machine. They're associated with actually with my uh, login somewhere and I can reattach to them. Um, separately when I go home on another machine and suddenly all the, all these um, same windows are, are available. So that's that's part of the functionality that, that Tmux um, provides. So evidently this primer is going to go through both um, Vim and uh, Tmux. Oh, this is not really so much of a, of a, um, a primer as a bunch of uh, time-wasting nonsense. Um, so I don't think that you need all of this kind of stuff. Most of what you need as a programmer to know about is more advanced stuff than this. Um, this is kind of a drag, actually. So installation and configuration. I, I don't want you to configure it. I want you to just learn how to type stuff into it and then learn how to use these features so that you know that these features are available. Um, configuration is incredibly important, and that's not really strange. It's, it's very important to configure it because that's what's ultimately going to save you time, but that's not really how you would start out. Um, I wouldn't bother configuring anything when I start out. First, I, I want to figure out what's going on. Um, so this is completely a drag. I, I, in fact, I'm, I'm just going to ditch that for now. There are some other books there. I, I often like the books. Um, there is a tutorial within Vim, which I've done. Um, if we go to the very first hit, here, it points out that there is a uh, tutorial in Vim, and that if you say help tutor, let me just uh, try that, I'll just go uh, help uh, tutor, and um, it says that I can use this 30-minute tutorial to get the most basic functionality. Um, and I can start it, it says here, from the shell. Presumably this is the case in, um, in the labs if you use um, CentOS 7. I haven't actually checked that, but you can, you can probably um, do it. Um, I don't know that we have Vim installed on Windows here. You can install it very rapidly, um, and I can show you how to do that. Um, let me just do it. Let me open a, my own uh, command line here and see what happens if I, if I do it. I'm just going to put a, um, a terminal onto this screen here. And... Um, this is actually open in Tmux. The junk that you can see at the bottom of the screen is, uh, is this is all Tmux junk. But I'm just going to attempt this Vim Tutor thing and see. Okay, so it is set up here um, as it is on any um, on any uh, Unix machine. This is a Mac, by the way. Mac OS X is a form of Unix. Okay, so I can actually do it here, um, and I'm using the HJKL keys in order to um, in order to, to do this stuff. So it says, before doing any of this stuff, read the entire lesson. So this is a fairly well-debugged tutorial. I would say 
that uh, this would be a useful tutorial to go through. I have gone through it myself um, probably more than once. Let me just um, end there for now. So let me suggest that that be your first thing to do. And then let me also just ask you, just you know, in case you've seen this missile, um, the Army is looking for it. it. I guess it fell off of a helicopter in upstate New York. Now, if you know where Fort Drum is, you hopefully know that, um, and, and you know where New York City is, you know that uh, it's not likely to be here on campus. This missile probably did not fall on campus. They were, the helicopter was, was trying to fly south from Fort Drum to New York City, and, and we're probably not on that flight path unless the guy was like really lost. But, but anyway, this just came out on the news, and I thought I would mention it to you. In case you see this um, missile, uh, contact usarmy.mil. And, um, and they'll be glad that you did, and so will I. Thank you for your attention.